So we continue our study in this absolutely fascinating and intriguing book, Revelation. Now, if you want the book of Revelation summarized in one chapter, that's correct. You can get the entire book of Revelation, a summary of it, in one chapter. You will find it in Daniel chapter 7. So if you're saying to the pastor, I can't believe we've done all these chapters. You've been over a year when you could have done it in one week. <laughs> but you would have missed all the details. But Daniel chapter 7 summarizes the book of Revelation. So here's the chronology of events in chapter 20 that have brought us to chapter 21 today. The 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ upon the earth has come to an end. And at the end of that millennial reign of Christ, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and death itself is thrown into hell or what we call the lake of fire. The day of the Lord has come and gone. The day of the Lord is that great day of judgment when God sits upon the throne and a mass, a sea of humanity stand before him. And at that point, God judges all the wickedness that has ever existed upon the earth. And those who die in their wickedness, hence they're seen as dead. They're dead because they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And they have not received Christ for the forgiveness of sin. That is the day of the Lord. That is the great judgment. It has come and gone. Now, simultaneously with that, every saint who has received Christ for the forgiveness of sin doesn't face the judgment because their name is in the book where those who die in their sins, their names are in the books. Yes, you remember. Very good. And that brings us to the earth and sky fleeing from God's presence, never to be seen again. Now we're at chapter 21. So let's pray. Screen's a little in front of me. Father, I'm reminded of your mission that you have given to every pastor. And so today we ask for this, not just at the Gloucester County Community Church, but all four corners of the globe. We ask that the weak would be strengthened, that the bruised and the broken would be put back together again. Those with sickness in their body would receive a healing touch. And Lord, those who are drifted, and we know when we're there. We know when we're not where we once were with you. And the distance that we have created by walking away from you. I ask this would be the day of return and Lord, for those who are lost in their trespasses and sins as we've seen in each service, we pray that this would be the day of new beginnings, that the lost would be found. Open our eyes, Holy Spirit, to the truth of your word, this, this uh, never-changing truth in this ever-rapidly changing world. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. and the church said, Amen. so here we are. John is seeing a revelation, a vision. And he says, then I saw a new heaven. After all of this has gone as past that we just brought you to. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, finish it. And there was no longer any sea. Say that with me. And there was no longer... And he see, come on, George, 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 join me. And there was no longer any C. Push the save button, sort of make a little file and set it up on your computer screen because we're going to come back to it. Then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, reading with me, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride 
beautifully dressed for her husband. Now recall, the old earth and sky are gone. God creates a new heaven. He creates a new earth which contains no sea. Now why does this new earth contain no sea? Because the sea is symbolic of the turbulence of life. Think about it. The tsunami, the tsunami, the tsunamis, and I'll get it right. <laughs> and the hurricanes, they come out of the sea. The way the water and the temperature and everything collides, it crosses into or upon the land. That represents the turbulence of life created by sin, and it's going to be gone. There will no longer be any sea. Instead, we'll have a river from which we drink called the river of life, which is symbolic of the fact that we will live forever. And then that, those rivers flow into these peaceful lakes because the Prince of Peace shall be our governor, shall be our king, shall be our Lord. So when we see this new order of things, not only is it real, but it's representational of, of what is to come. Then John sees something very interesting. He sees the holy city, and you know that the tabernacle is the exact representation of the glory of God in heaven, where he dwells. And he says that over and over again. If you want to see what heaven looks like, where God dwells, look at the tabernacle. It is a pattern of heaven itself. That comes down now, and it dwells amongst men. As a bride beautifully adorned for her husband. Now this is an obvious picture of the church, the bride of Christ beautifully adorned by the righteousness of God himself for Jesus the groom. When I pray for couples during their wedding ceremony, I have pretty much prayed the same prayer for every couple, you know, revising it depending on the circumstances. But I'll always begin my prayer something like this. Father, today I am once again reminded that before you ever instituted the government or even ordained this mystery that we call the church, you put together a man and a woman and you blessed them. So Lord, today as Justin and Brittany have, have come together, we ask for your blessings upon their lives. We ask that the love that they have for one another would never wane but with each new day, week, month, and year, only increase. And yes, Father, in this age of ever-increasing pressure upon the marriage union, we ask that you would grant them mental, emotional stability, physical health. And although we've made light of it, we pray that you would bless them financially. Not so much that they would feel they have no need of you, but that you would put praise upon their lips for your goodness to them. And yes, Lord, should you bless them with children, we ask that you would give them the wisdom to rear their children in the way that they should go so that when they've reached maturity, they'll not depart from it, and they'll respect their father and call their mother blessed. In Jesus' name. And then often I'll close with the Lord's Prayer, just singing it. Notice something in that prayer. It says, before you ever instituted the government or even ordained this mystery that we call the church, you put together a man and a woman and you bless them. Do you see the picture? Marriage is the picture of the bride of Christ. Listen, why aren't we married in heaven? How come we were married on earth? I said to Cheryl, I do. Cheryl said to me, I do. But when we get to heaven, we're not married. Why aren't we married? Take 20 seconds and ask your neighbor. Go ahead, I'm counting, quickly. Come on, Shane. I'm going to ask you what the answer is, so you better come up with it. 
Ask your sister, she'll know. Ask mom, she'll know. Ask dad. So Tanya, why aren't we married in heaven? Are you asking me? Yes, you were. And you were correct. Because we're his bride. Listen, I can't have two wives in heaven. And wives, you can't have two husbands in heaven. You can only have one and guess who he is. Jesus. That's why you're not married in heaven, because you are the bride of Christ. Now, all you guys that wanted to be women, now you have your chance, you see. You're, you, are, you are the bride of Christ. Here, oh, I'm in trouble now. A thousand emails coming in. But you get the point. You are the bride of Christ. All of us, beautifully adored, coming out from heaven. Why does it come down from heaven to earth? That's an interesting question. You know, why don't we go to heaven? Why does heaven come down to us? Now here, there's another picture about marriage, and I, never, I can never forget the day it happened. Typically, what I'll do is I'll get a story on the couples. See, there's in a marriage ceremony, we have this address to the couple. You know, we are gathered together in the sight of God to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable state instituted of God, signifying unto us the mystical union which exists between Christ and his church, which God adorned with his presence of Cana, Galilee, and so forth. You know, I've done enough of these. i got to memorize. So anyway, so, um, uh, so then once you say that and you say you may be seated, we have what's called the charge of the couple. So the bride has come down the aisle with the father on her, her arm in most instances, or the bride on the arm of the father, and I get to the charge of the couple and I move, like yesterday I did a wedding, so it's Justice and Brit Brittany, it's in my head, Justin. So I'll move Justin right next to the, the father's bride, Ron Fisher Keller, and uh, just before the giving of the bride, and we do this charge of the couple, which says that basically they've come to the order and in transparency. And that means that Justin doesn't have three wives in Utah and 17 kids, you know what I mean? Like, he's told you the truth, Britt, you know, he really has it. So when I get to this part just before I pray, I tell little stories on the couples that I get from the parents. And in most instances, they find a story that the, the, the spouse, the bride or the groom, doesn't know about. And it embarrasses. It's a, one of those fun moments in a, in a wedding ceremony, you know. They, 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 uh, they sort of turn uh, all different colors. It's just, it's just kind of a cool thing. So um, what will happen is, you know, I'll, I'll tell this story on, on the couple. And then I re there was this one instance where I didn't get a story from the um, bride's side, only the groom's side. And I felt kind of like I can't really tell a story on the groom and not on the bride. So what happens when you don't know what to do? Come on. You pray. So I prayed, Lord, what do I do? And listen, I had been, I'd been doing weddings for about 20 years or more. And like that, the Lord revealed something to me I'd never seen before in my life. That the wedding, a marriage, is symbolic of salvation and salvation is symbolic of a wedding never saw that before how are we saved come on you know a we do what admit the truth about ourselves that we're sinners b we believe the truth about god that he did something about it in the person of jesus c we commit ourselves to his righteousness and d there's a day that we do it is that not correct? correct. All six of you. Yeah. How else did you get saved? I'd like to know. Because it's pretty hard without those steps. You know what I mean? We admit, we believe, we commit. There's a day that we do it. Now, all of a sudden it dawned to me, that's what a marriage is. Justin and Brittany admitted they were incomplete without one another. As we admit, we're incomplete without God. B, they believed that they were the perfect person for each other. C, Daryl's just giving Sandy a little nudge. C, they committed themselves to one another until death does them part. And D, there's a day that they did it. Just like salvation. So I've done that every wedding, every wedding since. 
you know, it's a kind of a sneaky, forgive me for using that word, sneaky way of getting the gospel in and not being preaching in a wedding, like, well, we didn't come here to pray or sermon. So, you know, in about a one minute and 20 seconds, you just laid out the plan of salvation. They don't even know what happened. They walk out and go, that was strange. Well, where'd that come from? This is a great way to do it. So back to our text, verse three. And I heard, what kind of a voice? Wow. Oh, that was good. Way to go. Where was it coming from? Saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now to this point, God is with us in the sense that the Holy Spirit lives in us. Now is he present? Yes. But nothing like we're going to see in the new order of things. Nothing. Now, in this new order of things, God's dwelling place, heaven, comes down to earth. That's pretty amazing. Just like Jesus came down to earth, which is God's demonstration of love for us, and while we were yet sinners, he dies for us. God is constantly reaching out to you and me. Amen. You know, it's not that we reach out to him, it's he reaches out to us. Look, when Adam and Eve blew it, who was chasing them around? Was that, were Adam and Eve chasing God around? No. no. God's chasing them around. Where are you, Adam? No, he didn't say it like that. Adam? Adam? I know I made him with ears. I'm sure he can hear. And I made him with a mouth. But I only gave him one mouth and two ears because we should listen twice as much as we speak. So, yeah, uh, to Adam. Adam! I'm over here, Lord. God, in his love and his mercy, is always seeking us out. And in this new order of things, he brings it all. Look at this. We will be his people. And God himself will be with us. And look at what he's going to do. Come on, read it with me. He will wipe, come on, every tear from their eyes. Why? Why is every tear gone from our eyes? Look at this. Because there will be no more death, mourning, crying, pain, because the old order of things has passed away. See, presently, God is in heaven. God. By the way, Father God has a form. As the Son has a form. The Spirit does not have form. But Father God does have a form. If you recollect, Moses said to God, Can I see you? Can I see your glory? And God said, I, I let my glory pass by, but you can't see my face. God is saying that because if you see my face, you will die because no man can look at me and live. God is too holy. He's too great in his nature. So he said to, to Moses, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over the cleft and you can see my hinder parts, but you can't see my face. This God is going to dwell amongst men. It's pretty amazing. Look at this. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, Do not be, read it with me, quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. Why? Because God is where? In heaven and you are on earth. In other words, God sees and hears everything. Don't think you're going to get away with something. God can't see me. I'm going to walk into the vault of TD Bank and lock the door and God won't see me. No. God is in heaven. After this manner, we ought to pray. How did he tell us to pray? Our Father, where is he? Which, Which art in heaven. God is in heaven, but yet he sees it all. And I love this first part of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Do not be quick with your mouth and don't be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God because he's seeing it and hearing it. What is the Holy Spirit saying to us? He is saying that we can say what we want about people on earth and not necessarily be held accountable for it. Here. But there is a day when we will be accountable for what it is we say 
about people. Um, in our circle of friends, uh, Steve and Des Childs are a part of our circle, and Steve will teach. He's an excellent teacher. And uh, the, the other day, he taught on taming the tongue. An excellent study. And there was this quote in there, and I didn't know from whom it came. And uh, he says, that, that, that was really kind of an original. So I posted it the next day, and I gave him credit. Shooting from the hip is not meant to be accurate. Just quick to the kill. And too many of us, with our mouth, shoot from the hip. And our purpose isn't to heal, it's to wound. But look at what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, verse 29 says. This is God's instruction to me, your pastor, and you and everyone in this building. This is the instruction to saints. We should distinguish ourselves from the world. The world, we know we are Christians by what? Our love for one another. So let's stand and say this. We can't sit. Because these are God's instructions to us. So little act of reverence by standing. Let what? Pause. Ask your neighbor, what's unwholesome mean? And get an answer, just don't ask the question. Yes, I like that. Who called out not nice? There you go. That's a great definition. It's just not nice. You know, like we can get fancy with the explanations. But it's just not nice. Don't let any not nice words come out of your mouth. But only what? What is helpful in building others up. And now notice, according to their need. So we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit on what is the need of this person at that moment. Sometimes we're in tune to that and sometimes we're not. You know, it's what we call being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Like the time William Perez was in the visitor's line, lined up at the desk, and God just clearly said to me, go speak to that man. It's his first time ever here. And you remember how God put his marriage together. He wanted to take his life, redeemed his life. Just those moments, hear me, when you sense God speaking to you in those moments, don't say no to it. You know, the, the, old, the old King James says that he speaks from our kidneys. It's a great word. It means it's in our gut. And when you, when you hear God in your gut, more instances than not, it's God. Respond. So he says, look, according to their needs, that it may what? Benefit those who listen. Now, years back in the, in the, in the uh, theater... I gave a series called Bodybuilding, not this kind of bodybuilding, but Building the Body of Christ. And we kind of came up with this little expression that when someone said something not very nice about somebody, we would woe them. I'll show you a picture of the woe. Let's practice it. Whoa. So if I were to say, <clears throat> can you believe what Bruce King is wearing today in church? Can you believe what the pastor said today in church? You're going to go, Whoa. oh, that was so anemic. <laughs> You're going to go, Whoa. yes. You'd be surprised how that works. Somebody just says something not nice about somebody, you just go, Whoa. practice, come on. I know you only have one arm. It works really good when you have two, but I had the same thing done, so that's all right. See, but I've got motion now. You got that? You'll get it too. You ready? Whoa. So let's read the next verse. Let's keep moving. He's going to wipe, I love this, every tear from their eyes. Because there's no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. This whole old order of things is past. This expression, no tears in heaven, doesn't come from Eric Clapton's song, <laughs> Tears in Heaven. 
which is kind of ironic because when you get to verse 6, this is what he says. Watch. Beyond the door, there's peace, I'm sure, and I know there'll be no more tears in heaven. Why? Think about it. There's no death. What brings us to tears? Death. Death of a loved one. Death of something or someone we've loved. Death of something that was dear to us, that's gone. It brings us to tears. Mourning over what we've lost or we wish we had or something that is that we wished we possessed or never possessed, and it brings us to tears. Or pain in so many ways. It has so many faces. Think about this pain. It's emotional, it's mental, it's physical, it's spiritual. All of that will be gone. Why? Because there is a new order of things. Say that. There is a new order of things. Give God a round of applause. So look at it. You may be seated quickly. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, that's a new order. But it's not everything that has become new. Because look at it. The old is past. Behold, the new has come. Now, here's what he's referencing. That when we receive Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we become new creations. But we still live in tension. There's still Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We never get rid of that until glory. So we live in this tension. So here's what we got. We have new wine in old skins. You following me? And that really doesn't work when you think about it. Because if you put new wine in old skins that have already been stretched, what do they do? Take a little go, pop. Can you do that with me? Pop. That's good. Try it again. Come on, Adam. Pop. And that's what happens. So we, we kind of live in this turmoil that won't be turmoil because when everything's made new, we're not going to have to worry about it. So look at it. This is what he says. He says, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown. Oh, wait a minute. I'll say the line. You'll fill it in. All right. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown. Now, what does that mean? That means it dies, it decays. So it's sown perishable. Now look at this, the old order. It's sown perishable. But here's the new order. It is raised imperishable. So the old skin that dies and decays, we're going to get a new skin. Some of you are saying hallelujah. What are you laughing about, Ron? You're looking at me? No, no. All right. You're with me. I'm glad you're alive. Okay. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised. It is sown in. It is raised in. It is sown in natural. It is raised a. Now look at that again. I'm going to go through it quick because you ought to put it on your uh, refrigerator. It's something really worth looking forward to. Look at this. It is sown. It is raised. Now, see, you ought to have those two words on your refrigerator. This is where I am now. This is what I have to look forward to, the new order of things. Okay? It, it, it is sown in. It is raised in. Glory. So there are your two words. You're contrasting the two. It is raised in glory. It is sown in. It is raised in. It is sown a. It is raised a spiritual body. How cool is that? That's the new order of things. And just, this is, this is it, here it is, just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, the old skin, so we shall bear the image of the what? Heavenly man. Yes, thank God. So he who was seated on the throne said, I am making some things new. 
Boy, you were slow to correct your pastor. Let's try that again. And he was seated on the throne and said, I am making some things new. Then he said, write it down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done because I am the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Everything means everything. Everything that has been corrupted by sin and Satan is going to be made new. That's why there's no sea, because its turmoil and its corruption is gone. Everything is going to be remade. Everything is going to be new. Now, I don't quite understand the things that he remakes and the things that he just throws away and starts all over again. You know, I'm not quite sure why he chooses to remake some things and just make everything new. That's God's choice, and it's trustworthy and true. It, it kind of reminds me of when we moved. About nine years ago, we decided to downsize. The kids were gone, so we sold our house in Pittman, and we, we bought a condo, and we, we had to downsize. So what we decided to do was make everything new. That we were going to, in the, in the new place, everything was going to be new, all except for a few paintings that I had collected over the years that I wanted to adorn my walls with. Um, and we did. So we had like, you know, those like open house sales, you know what I mean? Yeah, and we would just let people come in, and we would negotiate. You'd be surprised how cheap some people are. <laughs> you know, like, Yo, you know what that's worth. What are you offering me $10 for? No, whoa, it's the truth. But anyway, so, so we, 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 would, we would sell this, and, you know, and, and we had one day, we have another day, and it was the funniest thing. You know, when we were done, you know, we had this stuff, and we are not taking it with us. So we lined the curb, like probably about 60 feet, of curb, three rows deep. You can't believe how many human vultures there are. <laughs> I am telling you, by the next day, it was all gone. People of every size, shape, language, you name it, they just came and pillaged the curb. <laughs> Everything was gone. Everything was gone. <clears throat> I love this picture. You got to see this picture of the new wine and the, the new skins that God's going to give us. And I want to talk to you in closing a little bit about that. See, you, you know how we really know we're Christians? Because when we try and shove the old wine into the new wine skins, it doesn't fit. See? Now, I, I tried to find some pictures of women whose clothes didn't fit, and I couldn't put any of them <laughs> on the screen. This was like the only thing that I could find. But think about this. When we sin or we live in disobedience and we really know the Lord, it doesn't fit. The sin, the disobedience doesn't fit. It's like this shirt, pop, one button. The next button, you know, and you just know it's not right because you're trying to shove this old sin into a regenerated nature. So where is it? Come on, where is it that you're trying to shove this old wine into what God has made a new skin. Now, I'm not talking about this flesh. Now, granted, we're never going to have complete victory over this until the new order of things. But if we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and we want our clothes to fit, you ever kind of like... <laughs> and you have to kind of do this to get your waist <laughs> tucked in, you know? If you're having to do that in your spiritual life, something ain't right. You know, it's time to start doing your spiritual exercises. There's leg lifts, you know, push-ups. Read your Bible, pray, get right with God. Where is it you're trying to shove the unrighteous into the righteous and you know it doesn't fit? just feels uncomfortable. That's a good place to be. I'm there more than I'd like to be. My God, not again. What's wrong with you? <laughs> no, what's 
What's wrong with me? Amen. Amen. So I, I really think it would be appropriate if today we took a little time and prayed for one another. So I'd like us to change our posture. You could kneel or stand, but you, you can't sit unless you're unable to stand or kneel. So could, could we change our posture one way or another? In the balcony too, could we change our posture? Over here on the left of the balcony, the right of the balcony, just change our posture. In the back. And, and I'd like you to connect. Can we do that with someone? You don't have to hold hands, but maybe a hand on a shoulder. Just everybody connected in some way. I'd like you to pray for a person that you're connected with. Now, you probably don't even know their name. And that's okay. And what I'd like you to pray is that God would... You, you recall the scene where Peter's walking on the water and he's about to sink. And he says just three words. He says, Lord, help me. And in a moment, in an instant, Jesus reached down and picked him up and helped him. So the person who you're connected with if they're not there now, they will be trying to shove the old wine into the new skin and it's not just working. And I'd like you to pray that God would grant them a deliverance. Yes, do for them what they can't do for themselves. So just in this quietness of the moment, pray for them. Father, as this body of Christ, Today, as we've heard that we are to build up this body and meet them at their point of need. So that's what we do. Lord, maybe it's a son or a daughter who's struggling to stay clean. The marriage that needs repair mortgage that's unpaid the loss of a mother or a father or a brother or a sister a nephew a niece you know the pain and you know where Lord we are walking in disobedience to you maybe it's a relationship that, that you want circumcised from our life Something that's being watched on television or on the computer or whatever it is where we're trying to shove into this clean and righteous skin that which is unrighteous and unclean. Lord Jesus, do for us what we can't do for ourselves. We call upon you this morning. To rescue us. Lord, if we had the strength to do it on our own, most likely we, al we already would have. So it's you that we ask for your amazing grace to save us in our wretched state is our prayer. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost, but now I'm found. 
T'was blind, but now I see. Praise God, 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 praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. You may look this way. And for those of you who have yet to receive Jesus, you don't know if the Holy Spirit lives in you. In fact, if you were to pass from this life to the next, you wouldn't know where you'd spend it. I would be so remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Let the Holy Spirit indwell you so that when he calls you home, that Holy Spirit's going to go to its home where Father and Son live. It's really simple. You admit the truth about yourself. You believe the truth about God. You commit your life to him. You do it today. So if we could shut our eyes, for those of you who have yet to receive Christ, this is your moment, the day of salvation. Say, Father in heaven, say those words to yourself, Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Forgive me for the things I've done that are wrong. You've called them sin, so I acknowledge to you that I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry. Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life. 